Hello, everyone. I'm Russ Poulin, Executive Director of WCET, and I want to welcome you to the 33rd and second fully virtual edition of WCET's annual meeting. While we're doing this virtually, we really look forward to seeing you in person again next year in Denver on October 19th to 21st of 2022. Meanwhile, we're really excited about the opportunities afforded by these virtual events, as many more people can participate, and we do want you to participate. Uh, use the platform to ask questions during sessions, uh, and the event platform also allows you to connect with speakers and other attendees outside of the session and within the, within the event platform. So if you hear or see somebody that you want to connect with, you can do so through us, uh, through speed loop, through feed loop. And to participate live, you'll need to be present for the sessions. Uh, the annual meeting is structured so that you can devote attention to a one day of compelling speakers, uh, lightning talks, and breakout sessions. Well, we know your life is busy, but it'll be valuable for you to stick with us today and see all the uh, great sessions and be part of them and ask questions. Uh, we um, hope we have lots of answers for you today. Also join us for the networking lunch. Well, it's uh, 1.30 Eastern and 10.30 10 Pacific, so it's lunch-like, uh, as we can get during a virtual conference with uh, all the time zones that we're going across. Uh, there'll be some surprises during that time and also a drawing uh, for a $75 gift card. Okay, all right, so that's enough of the pregame announcements for all this, and it's time for us to kick off the annual meeting. So uh, let's get this going. And we're happy to do it with a session on blockchain. Uh, this is an innovation that has great promise for higher education students, and let's all learn about this together. And it's my honor to introduce the moderator for our first session, uh, Feng Ho, uh, who will moderate this opening panel. He is the Digital Transformation Evangelist at Maryville University and also Chief Executive Officer at Pistis, a blockchain platform. He previously served as the Chief Information Officer and Chief Learning Officer at Central New Mexico Community College in Albuquerque, uh, where he oversaw the Office of Digital Strategies, as well as IT operations in Central New Mexico's online college. He's an award-winning uh, award CIO and is a leading blockchain expert, and we're so happy to have him here today. So thank you for leading this session and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Russ, and I really appreciated the intro. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you're joining from. Welcome. And uh, my name is, again is Feng Ho. I'm the Chief Digital Transformation Evangelist at Maryville University in St. Louis and a co-founder and CEO of a blockchain service company called Pisces.io. I'm thrilled today to have the opportunity to moderate this opening session with a group of really distinguished panelists. I'll ask our panelists to introduce themselves in just a moment, but I want you all to know that it is such an honor for me to be on the same virtual stage with them and ask them to share with you, the audience, their thoughts about how we can empower learners by unlocking the full potential of transcripts and credential with blockchain technology. But first, let me ask you, the audience, to please raise your hands if you have heard about NFT lately. And NFT stands for non-fungible tokens. Many high-priced artworks, memorabilia, and collectibles are being traded today as NFTs. For example, Twitter founder Jack Dorsey has recently sold his very first tweet he sent on Twitter as an NFT for $2.9 million. And another buzzword that you may have heard is metaverse, which is a virtual space that is connected to the real world. Facebook, as you all know, has just changed its name to Meta to become the first metaverse company. Of course, you have all heard about the Bitcoin. It is a cryptocurrency that was first mined in 20, uh, 2009 for pennies. Today, its price has reached over $60,000. So what are all these things in common? Blockchain. As a distributed ledger technology, DLT, blockchain is the underpinning technology that runs the Bitcoin, NFTs, and the metaverse. And the major features of blockchain includes provenance, security, trust, and immutability. And blockchain certificates can be easily and reliably verified and tracked. 
Gartner, an IT think tank, has predicted that blockchain will transform higher education in the following four ways. It will improve record keeping, increase efficiency in existing business processes, create a new market for digital assets, and to create a disruptive business model in higher education. With blockchain and smart contract technologies, schools have been issuing degree diplomas, transcripts, digital badges, and certificates of all kinds on blockchain that can be instantaneously verifiable and shareable. A learner-owned credential solution can also keep immutable learner's records to help learners with st student transfers and lifelong learning. And speaking of the student credentials, let's also take a quick look at the current credential landscape in the United States. Last year, according to Credential Engine 2021 report, over 967,000 unique credentials were issued in the United States alone. The report described this vast and growing credential landscape as confusing and inefficient. So, how can we help our learners maximize the value of their hard-earned credentials to get better paid jobs easier and in doing so, help closing the equity gaps among different gender and ethnic groups. I can't wait to hear from our panelists, so let's get it started. I'd like to first introduce Dr. Angie Patiani, Executive Director of Colorado Department of Higher Education. Hi, Angie. Would you please introduce yourself to the audience and say a few words about the great work you're doing in leading the higher education in the state of Colorado. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, excited to, to hear how this panel moves us forward. Um, we in Colorado, we are um, constantly trying to innovate and to make sure that we are learner-centered, student-centered, and um, see how we can close those equity gaps, uh, especially as it relates to social mobility. Um, and so we, um, we are part of, um, a grant uh, called Credential As You Go with North Carolina and New York as the other two states engaged in this. And we're, we're using some of the great work that's been done at Dallas and, um, and around the world as a, as a model to see how can we really create kind of a, an, uh, both a learning and a employment passport, if you will. Um, I, I've traveled the world. I've been fortunate to travel the world and I have my passport. And when you see my passport, you'll see all of the places that I've been when I've been there. You won't see what I've done there, but you could if you wanted to. I could tell stories. But having that kind of a passport allows students to own their record and be able to uh, be social, socially mobile anywhere they want in the world. And they will own their own learning and employment record. So we're very excited about that and trying to move that forward in the state. Great, thanks, Angie. And my second, uh, the, the second panelist I'd like to introduce is Dr. Piper Wilkins. And uh, uh, Dr. Wilkins, if you can just uh, introduce yourself also and the, to the audience as well as share with us the great work, the wonderful job you and Dr. Joe May are doing at the Dallas uh, College, please. Sure, happy to do so. Good morning from Dallas, at least. Everyone, uh, my name is Piper Wilkins. I'm the Vice Chancellor of Workforce and Advancement at Dallas College in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we are home to more than 70,000 students this fall. Uh, 32,000 of those students are the first in their families to attend college. So we have a very large P-TECH program, early college high school, and a lot of really strong partnerships with our public school partners and our four-year uni four universities in our region. We've really spent um, the last 18 months in Dallas consolidating um, our seven colleges who were all previously independently accredited into one college and doing that during a pandemic. So we've learned how to be really flexible as we've moved back and forth from virtual to hybrid and now back to primarily in-person work. But more importantly, we've spent the, the last five years building what we call the Career Connected Learner Network and removing barriers for students, trying to make sure that we help them meet their basic needs so that they can be successful and focused on their education with us. And one of those barriers historically has been the ability of the student to share their learner record, whether that's 
with another college or university as they transfer to a different institution or with an employer as they try to move into the workforce. So we've worked ex extensively to implement blockchain technology over the past five years to help remove this barrier. So I'm happy to be here with everybody today to talk about that a little bit and share our experience. Thank you. Now I'd like to bring in our last panelist, Dr. John DeMond, Director of Knowledge Media Institute from the Open University. John joins us this morning or this afternoon in his time all the way from England. Welcome, John. Uh, if you can, uh, please introduce yourself to the audience and say a few words about the Open University and the innovative work that uh, you've been doing. Oh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, thanks for inviting me. So the um, I, I've only ever actually worked in one place. I went to the Open University as a PhD student to do a PhD in AI to build an AI tutor and just stayed because it was so fabulous. I, I'm now a full professor of computer science and the director of the Open University's uh, Research and Innovation Center. So we have 80 folks producing new tech, which the Open University uses to teach its 175,000 students. I should say that the word open for the Open University means that you do not need any qualifications to start studying with us. We have students who have literally not studied for over a decade and could would not be able to get into a standard uh, university. We also take social justice very seriously. Over 20,000 of our students have a, dis a declared uh, disability. We founded our own MOOC company, FutureLearn, which I think is the fourth largest in the world that I, when I last checked, and has 10 million learners at um, uh, any one time. The Open University also has very strong links to the BBC. So anytime you see David Attenborough on TV with Blue Planet, Blue Planet 2, Frozen Planet, that's us, the co-production with us. Also the physicist, Brian Cox, he has a new program, the universe, and that's us. So, so, so it's really fabulous to be innovating for education in a, in a place that really believes in just in um, education for all. The, the, the link to blockchain was an obvious fit with the OU, with our um, um, decentralization. Um, viewpoint. We, at the very beginning, even before the internet started, we introduced what I called an Uber model of education, in that we disaggregated the academics that created the materials from the academics that deliver teaching. So we hired other professors to deliver teaching for us. But with blockchains, we've been um, looking at this technology since 2015 and been doing lots of uh, proof of concepts uh, um, and pilots. Um, as others have said, we've looked at accreditation. So even experimenting with physical badges, we had students on the, in summer schools with a physical badge that as they completed tasks would change color. And every time it changed color, it means they'd achieved a, 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 another micro step and that would be recorded forever uh, on the blockchain. Um, we've um, looked at using some AI techniques so you can embed the learning outcomes of courses into the smart badges that students get. And then you can automatically map those to the skills found in jobs, which you machine read online. So then you move towards what we call an AI um, career coach. Um, we're also looking at new business models uh, um, and what we call decentralized autonomous universities. So I'm looking forward to sharing um, so some of the things that we've been working on uh, within this fabulous panel. Fascinating, fascinating. Thank you all panelists. And so my first question is to all of the panelists. And I mentioned that uh, blockchain is a distributed ledger technology earlier. So what is your organization's story of why you believe in the promise and the potential of a distributed ledger technology. Uh, I, I, I can go first, if you like, if that's OK. Please. Um, so um, I could talk about the Open University all day long, but I'm not allowed to. So, um, so one thing I would add is that we're firm believers in lifelong education. Um, obviously, you do not know all you need to know when you're 23, when, when you leave college. Um, if one believes in lifelong education, that means one is going to learn at more than one institution. So then for us, it doesn't make sense 
that um, accreditation is organizational centric. It should really be learner centric. So that's a starting point, as, as uh, one of the other uh, panelists said. So then if one wants to create a learning record that the, the um, citizen carries around wherever they go, you, that should be personal to them. So they store that in their favorite place. And, and we've actually been doing some work with Sir Tim Berners-Lee. He has a technology called Solid, which is like a personal data store. Then you need a way of accrediting that or verifying that. So that the certificate I take out wasn't just written by my mother or my brother. So then the blockchain is a useful way for multiple parties to sign and, and so that um, uh, any certificate that I have, so that can be verified later on. One can also think about um, a blockchain provides support for lots of uh, micro payments and also recording reputation. This could be very valuable in this sphere as well. Great. Um, for for us in in Colorado, um, you know, we we again when we think about mobility, you know, Colorado is an importer state, if you will. Like many people come to Colorado and then stay, and so they are bringing with them their records. They bring with them their education from other places, and um, and so to make sure that this is all verifiable, as as John was saying, you know, we want to make sure that. You know, this is uh, these are accredited um, credits that they're bringing and they're learning and, and the skills and competencies that they may have uh, um, uh, uh, learned and, and attained. Um, we want it to be verifiable because remember, there was a there was a period of a few years there where people were putting things on their resumes and everything was you know made up and they were getting they were getting found out after the fact. And, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure if people were actually um doing surgeries, but there were people who were falsifying their information. And so this would be a way to make sure that it's verifiable across, across the globe. And so having this uh, blockchain as a, as a uh, technology will help with that mobility. We see it socially, but we also see it academically. People are transferring from uh, different institutions and, and uh, unfortunately some institutions are holding records hostage um, because of a fine that a student may have paid. And so they don't have an official transcript so that they can't really get into the next university. And so it's these kinds of things and these obstacles that are in the way for students to really have their, to own their record of learning and, and employment even. And so we are very interested in making this uh, universal across the state um, and then uh, really tapping into some of the existing networks so that students would be able to continue their their mobility wherever they want to go, knowing that they own their records. And so this is a big, it's a big thing for Colorado. We're trying to build the momentum so that we can have it uh, as a statewide approach. We are right now in the midst of a, a massive task force, kind of on the future of higher education. And so um, they will be uh, uh, sending recommendations to the governor on how to spend $95 million. And um, I'm hopeful that one of those suggestions will be finally the the advance of, of Bitcoin, not Bitcoin, of uh, blockchain here in Colorado. So very much like Angie, you know, we um, were talking about barriers and I mentioned barriers earlier. That's really been one of our primary focuses the past several years, remove the barriers that students face. And a lot of times we've seen that students, um, we lose students in transitions, transition periods from high school to community college, from community college to a four-year university, uh, from a community college or a university to work. We lose them in that transitional period. And the lack of ability for them to access and move their learner record is a big piece of that. I think we've probably all experienced that moment of panic when you're either um, applying for a job or going into an educational program and all of a sudden you have to have your official transcript. Well, where is that? It's at all the institutions that you've ever attended. You had to, in the old days, call or mail um, a letter to get that transcript, to get your own learner record. Uh, you couldn't get it any other way. And so that prevents people and has prevented many students from moving on to the next phase of learning or work. Uh, so it's, you know, it was for us solving a problem that was right in our face in 2016. As a for-profit institution, 
closed their doors immediately one day in the middle of the semester and left, I think it was over 40,000 students stranded without access to their own learner records. They couldn't go anywhere. And as Dallas College, we couldn't help them because we couldn't get their records either. Uh, so that was really, um, for us, the very beginning of what can we do? How can we prevent this from happening to others and us jumping into the blockchain world? Great, thanks. And now that we've learned why, and let's talk about the how. So my uh, next question is to you, Piper, and I will stay with you and then Angie. So can you share with the audience how you can get it started? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I, a lot of the how just happened as we tried to solve this problem for students that were coming to one of our colleges and saying, you know, our other institution just closed. I, I, I want to enroll. I want to continue my studies, but I don't have proof of anything. And so it was really um, sort of a, you know, a random conversation between Dr. Joe May, who's our chancellor, and a friend of his who were just trying to solve the problem. How can we get to these records? How can you put the records in the hands of the student? And so that is, is how we got started. It was nothing more than that conversation to solve a problem and a willingness to, to take some risk and jump in and figure it out together. Um, so, you know, if we had to start from scratch again, now there are many more uh, people that understand and know what blockchain is, that understand the learner record. But in 2016, it was brand new. So our how was very simple. It was a conversation, an agreement that we have to do something to remove this barrier, and then to begin to move down the line with willing partners who also wanted to help students. Thanks, and Angie? Yeah, we, we are, I, I would say we're still a bit in the startup phase. We've been having lots and lots of conversations around this. We are, you know, as I mentioned, we are now part of a, a, a grant that um, uh, Credential As You Go, that's gonna help us. Part of what we wanna do with that grant is to infuse blockchain into that Credential As You Go so that you can carry that passport with you, if you will. Um, we are um, also looking to, to learn from all the things that Dallas College has, has done uh, as an example and looking at um, outside, i say vendors who are in this space, who are doing it well. There's, there's a lot of people now in this space that wasn't five years ago, but now there are quite a few. And uh, we have already been working with Credential Engine um, we have, of course, with our Department of Labor and um, the, um, uh, the ETPL, um, the Training and Provider List, and so um, we also have the, our division of private occupational schools. We have over 300 of those schools and to, <laughs> we house their paper records up on neck, almost on the rooftop of our of the building in which our offices uh, exist. And and that's crazy when somebody has to get their record and we have to go up to the rooftop and and sort through all of these papers. And so we're trying to digitize those and uh, just imagine the efficiency that this will create if the students have their own records. And so we have um, we have a, a lot of irons in the fire and we're trying to coalesce so that we can be a resource because remember we're a state level agency. So our institutions are doing some things as well, but we wanna do this in, a, in concert, if you will, um, as a state so that we are all moving in the same direction, perhaps even using the same vendor, if you will. And, um, and so that the, the, as, as Piper said, the transfers and transitions between our institutions will be much easier. So this is part of that task force. This is part of what we're, um, we're working on. Um, and uh, we're excited to get to really launch. But the, the how is a, it's a big question and we're, we're still, I'd say, um, still working through that. <laughs> Yeah, probably just as many audiences, as, you know, they are trying to figure out about however that uh, we do have uh, uh, many institutions such as Dallas College and uh, uh, they have taken the first step and uh, then there are a lot of the experiences that I hope that can be beneficial to them. Uh, let's move on. My next question is for John. 
John, you, you've been leading the effort at Queen's uh, Open University to create an ecosystem with learners, educators, and employers from accrediting the micro-credential to identifying gaps and providing opportunities. So how does distributed ledger technology fit in the ecosystem of education? So please help put all this together for us. Yeah, um, great. So, so one of the great things about my job is I get to redefine areas. And that's what happens when a big technology comes along. So I, I spend my time thinking, what is the university? What is it for? What is ad adult education for? So, so one of the things about blockchain, it's a bit like the internet and the web. It doesn't make sense to design any solution for one organization. So if only one organization in the world had a web page, it wouldn't really be that useful. Um, so we think about designing ecosystems. And within the educational space, there are three main roles that we think about. There are the learners who receive certificates of one form or another. There are educators who may be individuals or organizations that issue certificates. And then there are employers who mostly map to the verifier role. So you have recipients, issuers, and verifiers um, um, in a sort of triangle. And then I think about one data space. So imagine if there's one data space which could support accreditation and all of those parties could easily um, uh, pass around, examine, and verify the certificates whilst maintaining privacy and control uh, for the learner then that would be a very different place today. And, and lots and lots of opportunities um, um, uh, arise from that. We, we, we've thought about, uh, we, had a, we were a part of a 40 million pound budget project, which was launched by Theresa May when she was the prime minister uh, around changing uh, accreditation for computer science um, in, in the UK. And we had 35 universities involved and uh, over 85 employers. So, so there we were thinking about, imagine if you had a regional or a national blockchain. So a place where all the accreditation was placed. There are some privacy issues, so you don't actually put the certificates there, you put the thumbprint certificates so that the, uh, um, the, the learners or the citizens have them and then they can pull them out and have them match. But you have a national place where everything can be verified um, um, yeah, easily, then um, you, you can you lower the cost for issuing certificates. So you almost end up in a place when anyone can issue a certificate to anybody else, but you know who it's from. So I can have a certificate, but then you can find out it's actually from my mother and, and not from a noble university because that's recorded forever. Or a university was issuing it, but then later that was found to be fraud. So all of those certificates can be um, redacted. Um, you can change the situations or the settings for assessment. So we've conducted uh, um, proof of concepts where students or employ employees issue certificates to each other, maybe for soft skills, someone that's good at organizing, somebody is good at leading. And again, you have the complete uh, uh, um, um, uh, um, tra traceability of that. You can have multiple parties signing certificates. So in, in the UK, we have apprenticeships which can be degree level. So then you can have university says, um, uh, we have an uh, apprenticeship with a Ford Motor Company. So the Ford Motor Company and the university uh, um, co-signs. We, we can also think about a sort of a, a mini pyramid system. So in fact, if you think about universities in the UK, they each have a badge or a certificate that allows us to issue degrees, except ours comes from the Queen. So we have a certificate from the Queen that says we can issue a certificate. Now you can think about um, uh, building on that and allowing parties to say, okay, this institute can issue these types of certificates for this period of time. And, and then you can check that. So, so it really uh, uh, um, um, changes the body. Uh, I mentioned the reputation system. So um, universities and individuals have a reputation. Um, MIT or Stanford may have a reputation. But that comes from maybe employers because the students are good. So you can think about managing the reputation system almost to the individual level where some employer says, I, we like these students from this faculty and this professor. 
and it would all, all, all be recorded in, in uh, uh, minute detail. So, um, so, so the uh, I think the boundaries, are, so the, the opportunities are really, really uh, endless for this. Thanks, John. And, and now that we have learned from all of our panelists about whys and the hows and how the blockchain can benefit uh, each partners in the education ecosystem. And let's talk about uh, a little bit and uh, about the return on investment. And uh, I mentioned that I work at Merivale University, say for example, we implemented uh, blockchain solutions to create uh, solutions for students to uh, request for transcripts on demand. And uh, they, it only takes about five seconds. So it creates a great benefit for our students. But what about the, for the institutions? And what about some of the financial uh, benefits because uh, some of the uh, student record or registrar's office may be concerned to say that uh, you know, student uh, transcript so far has been helping generating some of the revenues. So my uh, last question is for all panelists and which is what is the return on investment to the institution as well as to the learners. But of course, I would also uh, uh, like for you to take the opportunity to address not only the tangible benefits, but the intangibles that really uh, how to leverage the blockchain technology to help closing the equity gaps. So, uh, you know, whoever is ready and uh, please. Angie, can I call up? Yeah, yeah, I, I'd be happy to start. Um, you know, for me, I, I think uh, I, I'm very excited about the uh, what I call the the ROI around autonomy, the autonomy ROI that I I have my own agency. I can move and do and, as Piper said, overcome some of those those obstacles um, because I own my record. And I, I think that that convenience is what um, like, you know, right throughout the pandemic. I don't know about some of you, but. Boy, I used Instacart a lot. I didn't go to the store, the store came to me. And um, um, Amazon has shown how, how uh, remarkably um, uh, uh, beneficial that is not only to the consumer, but to them, right? In terms of their profit and so their ROI. So I think people are looking for co convenience. They're looking for that kind of autonomy. I can make my own decisions. I can go wherever I want to because I have my record with me. And so I think that's something it's hard to, to measure but it certainly gives people that, um, again, when I think about social mobility, but also the access in terms of equity. Um, that right now, if you can afford to get your transcript, your official transcript, great, then you can pay that. But um, if you can't, and you can't pay the fee that's holding your transcript hostage, then you're out of luck. And so for those uh, students who may be low income or maybe not have access to resources, they're out of luck. And that's that's just not right. And so we're, we're trying to advance all of those kinds of things in Colorado. We created a free application day three years ago where all of our institutions had that one day where students could apply for free. And it went over so well that we are now this year, we did free application days. So we had three days where students could apply for free. We're trying to eliminate those barriers um, of, uh, in that kind of way. We have the Colorado Opportunity Scholarship Initiative, which gives not only a scholarship, but also the wraparound support services. So we're trying to help students succeed any way we can. And I think this really works in that direction. Um, we finally opened up a, an office of educational equity where our focus is just on student success. How do we get students not just on the campus and not just feeling like they belong to the campus and that they have some power on the campus, but actually graduating from that, uh, that uh, program of study. And so these are things that we are trying to do to truly democratize education in Colorado, to make sure everyone has access, everyone has, it's affordable for everyone, and everyone has access to their own records as they progress, as they credential, as they go. So that's um, for us, I think there's a return on that to really empower the student and the learner. Um, so that's where we're headed. Thank you, Angie. Piper? Yeah, wow, Angie, I could have, uh, you and I are on the, exactly the same plane here. Um, you know, why are we here? Why are we here as institutions of higher education? 
we are here for the students. The student needs to be at the center of everything we're doing. And if we hold hostage their records, what are we doing? I mean, again, this is not about us. It's not about charging $2 to get a piece of paper that you mail and, and carry to uh, your next institution or to a job. So yes, it is, it's about equity for students. It's about removing the barriers. There's an ROI uh, that could be measured, you know, in terms of um, the cost to produce a paper transcript, whether that is personnel costs, materials, mailing, shipping, you know, all those things. But we've not really gotten into that here in Dallas. Again, it's more about putting the student at the center of this work and making, making this system work for them. So whether, you know, it goes to a, another college, that's one thing. But now we are moving on to how it goes to an employer and how an employer can match through the blockchain technology that we've implemented um, with specific skill sets that students have and kind of trying to pull those skill sets and those competencies out of the transcript information, uh, making that connection to work as seamless as we can uh, so that our students can go on and earn a living wage. John? Hi. So, so um, you have to remember that I'm a, uh, a, a, an academic that leads a research and innovation unit. So, but I have to keep my bosses happy. So, so I have a list of things which start from the things that I've convinced my bosses that we will do and we are doing, and then it ends up with the wacky things that, that, that I'm trying to push, but we're still doing them. So, so starting at the, uh, um, the, the more credible end, so the, we, we're doing some pilots at the OU on, um, and the students like this on, on building an app for them uh, um, where they can store their credentials. Um, if you have 175,000 students, of course, checking credentials is, is a big uh, business for us. We do a lot of regulatory reporting. I don't know if that's because we're the UK and we love bureaucracy or if it is uh, universal. Um, but we, I know that the, we have teams that are checking literally millions of records. And then every so often the government asks us a new question where we haven't stored the data. So we have to ask 175,000 students uh, some question and, and that can be hard. So, so reducing regulatory reporting. Uh, um, I've been talking to the regulatory re uh, reporting bodies around this. We, have, we, we love measuring things in the UK. So we have something called the TEF, uh, Teaching Excellence Framework, which will de determine um, UK government spending and things like how satisfied your students are with the courses, um, what's the um, added value that you provide, and blockchains can really help with this. Um, I've been talking to employers, especially companies like Reed, temping co companies, um, on um, reducing shortlisting. So some companies tell me they, they spend maybe 20 to 30,000 pounds for every new hire, um, and it's just a search. So um, uh, there are some companies I know that have blockchain based hiring platforms. So, so imagine a sort of verified LinkedIn where every qualification is checked. Then every time a, uh, an employer has an advert, they put it up and you automatically get a short list. So we've been talking to them and connecting them to the accreditation we have at the OU. And then that's sort of my first step to an AI career coach and a course recommender system. So then we can, a student can say, I want to be, for example, an astronaut. And then we can say, okay, we need to take these courses. Um, uh, um, or, or if you take these courses, you can be not an astronaut, but you can be something else. Because the, as I was mentioning earlier, the skills in job adverts are mapped to the learning outcomes in the blockchain birth certifications that people are acquiring. Um, uh, in, in terms of equity, um, we, we believe that we can really enhance employability. So especially for what we call the, the accreditation light. And, and that links to another concept that we have is called stackable credentials. So you can do one boot camp, you can do one summer school, and that contributes to a standard in Europe, which we call a micro credential, which the MOOC companies have 100, 150 hours of learning. You do a couple of micro credentials and they, and they contribute to a full degree. So you can really get someone in, in the door in an easy way and then map this to end because each accreditation, no matter how small, is mapped to others. 
you, uh, students can build this sort of connected graph of, of, of their own learning. And then on the more adventurous side, um, we're, we're thinking about what we call decentralized autonomous universities. So further decentralizing. So where, and, and there are a couple of companies that are doing this. So where, imagine if the faculty could be brought in from anywhere. Somebody could be a faculty of your university for a few weeks, contribute to some materials or contribute to a course, um, or somebody could deliver your materials as, as we've been doing for 50 years. Then you can begin to decentralize the components of a university, which allows you to bring in global talent and, and, and can benefit the students. And at the OU, we're used to this because, as I said, we use the BBC, we use people like David Attenborough, we have um, tutors from across the, the, um, the, the UK. And, and then finally, in terms of the equity, uh, one project that we're starting on, um, given that we could start the Open University back in the 1960s, where the main technology was the radio, we, we believe today with, with technologies, including the blockchain, we can build a, ref, uh, a university in a refugee camp. I, I heard this shocking statistic a while ago that the average time someone spent in a refugee camp is 17 years. So um, there's definitely time for, for doing many things. We could use a combination of local talent and bringing in materials globally with a with an internet. Great, great. Thanks all the panelists for the really outstanding answers. And I do have a follow up question later uh, to ask you what are some of the challenges uh, uh, and that you guys had to overcome. But we're seeing some uh, questions from the audience. So uh, if I can just uh, uh, answer a couple of them. Uh, or uh, just bring the questions up and uh, ask to see if the panelists uh, can answer some of them. And the first question is from Jeff Miller. And Jeff asks, uh, when records are kept and exchanged digitally, and this level of convenience is introduced, does this raise privacy concerns? So uh, uh, Jeff, a great question. And uh, if I can, uh, First, just uh, to offer uh, my understanding is that it was blockchain and then uh, basically all of the, the sensitive documents or data uh, is kept off the chain with uh, encryptions and with uh, all the other authentication protections and it's also stored if implemented correctly in a distributed manner. So in other words, then it's much secure uh, in terms of a privacy protection than a centralized solution when we have heard so much lately about the the, uh, the computer system being breached and the millions and millions of uh, uh, you know consumers records and uh, accounts being uh, you know stolen so in that sense then that the blockchain offers uh, a much more uh, security and privacy protection. But I'm also going to turn to the panelists to see if any of you would uh, uh, jump in and answer uh, Jeff's question. So, so I can have a go. So, so in our view, if this is implemented properly, the students would be, um, uh, would have uh, more power than they have today. So uh, other panelists have talked about records being locked away and you can't access them. So um, our vision is that the, each student controls where the certificates are. It's either on their mobile, on their laptop, or in their favorite place. But the student decides where they are. And we have to remember that in lifelong education, they're coming from uh, multiple parties. And then all you store on the blockchain is the equivalent to a thumbprint that's signed by the issuing organization. So the student keeps the... Um, uh, certificates in their favorite place and then and then releases them the other thing we, we worked on on the, on the on the app at the ou is that um, students could release their certificates for a time limited period so for example if they go for an interview they could give their interviewer access to the certificate for just one week and and then they would no longer uh, um, have access so, so so we believe that there would be increased empowerment we, we call this um self-sovereign certification Okay, thanks. And uh, uh, let me also move to the next question from Marsha Ham. 
and uh, uh, or or Masia, I, I apologize if I pronounced the name wrong. And the question is, how are you educating students on how they can access and use their education records in this blockchain model? Similarly, how are students able to share their records through this model to other institutions, employers that do not use blockchain? And uh, if I can I ask Piper if you can uh, answer that question. Sure, happy to do that. <clears throat> we, um, we have a very robust uh, student success model at Dallas College where we have a success coach that works with um, each student as they enroll with us, as they go through their uh, programs, whatever they're here to accomplish, they have a coach that holds their hand all throughout their journey. And the education about the blockchain transcript happens with that success coach as a part of orientation to begin with when they're brand new, but then ongoing as they work with their success coach over time. So we, you know, students have the option. They don't have to use the blockchain for transcripts. They can still pay $5 and have the transcript sent in the old fashioned method. But more and more, we are seeing students who definitely want to control their own record and therefore sign up to do this through the blockchain. But it, it is an educational process. We do it with employers on, uh, on the back end who are hoping to connect with talent from Dallas College to fill their workforce pipeline. So if a student is, is willing and wants to look for a job, be matched with an employer, we have just begun this process of having employers go in and sign up as well so that they can be matched. So we educate employers on one end and we educate students on the front end. Thank you, Piper. And uh, just to add to what Piper said that uh, uh, in general, uh, blockchain technology is uh, an open technology. So when uh, an institution issues that uh, any kind of educational records or transcript and uh, uh, degree diploma and so forth, and it can be verified on any of the, the, the system that uh, the institution used to issue those kind of uh, blockchain records and verifiable and shareable and generally speaking really at no additional cost for any uh, uh, users as well as employers so uh, it's very uh, convenient for uh, all parties to share that kind of a resource uh, as, as needed and we do have uh, one question from the twitter feed and uh, uh, saying that uh, we need to address uh, some of the standard uh, about blockchain. If, if I may jump in kind of uh, um, a little bit on the last question and this first question, you know, what, what we've done, and I think many states have done this, is, is that uh, notion of common course uh, numbering and common course names so that uh, transfers within our uh, ecosystem in Colorado are, are a little smoother. Of course, every every institution feels like their Psych 101 is very different than everybody else's Psych 101. But there are some very common universal uh, competencies and and course content in some of those courses. And so we've got some common course numbering. And there is, you know, we we have an academic council that they come together and they agree that they're on the standards, if you will, in terms of those um, the transferability of these courses from one institution to another. And I think we're approaching that same kind of thing that there is um, as some. Um, it may not be universal standard, but um, especially if we move to more competency and skills based. And so you, you would be able to identify here is the skill, here is the competency that has been earned in that course. And so if we can combine those things, so yes, we have the course in terms of a, a, a transcript. If you look at my transcript from Stanford, you know, 100 years ago, you still will see the same Psych 101 and 102. You'll see those and there's there's still an appreciation for what might have been taught um, at that level. And so, um, but if it also had the competencies in terms of critical thinking or, you know, um, you know, lab experience or, you know, things like that, then that would make it even more comprehensive. So maybe we're going to be moving to that as well. Maybe we already have it. 
Thank you, Angie, and I really appreciate that answer. And uh, uh, let's go back to that standard uh, uh, question from the Twitter. And as we all know that the blockchain, as I mentioned, is a distributed ledger technology. And uh, in other words, then that, uh, uh, you, you know, some of the audience may be uh, uh, wondering that uh, since we may have uh, uh, different blockchains and then how can we use, uh, you, you know, this to, uh, you know, uh, make them be interoperable and be communicating with each other and so forth. So the standard really uh, comes from the, the fundamental uh, kind of uh, characteristic of a blockchain. So in other words, then that uh, it needs to be distributed and uh, it needs to provide that immutable record and that the record uh, has to be verifiable uh, really reliably and easily and it can be shareable and provide that kind of uh, privacy and the security and it needs to be you know encrypted and so forth so as for some of the specific blockchains itself and we may have heard of course uh, many people know today that there are bitcoin blockchain there are ethereum blockchain and there are hyperledger blockchain these are uh, pretty much the main dominant uh, uh, blockchains that uh, uh, you, you know, different uh, uh, service blockchain service providers are using, and uh, we can definitely talk uh, about that if uh, if uh, we're interested. Talk about this offline. But however, the fundamental uh, standard, as I'm speaking about, is uh, that the, the the major characteristic of any blockchain record that needs uh, to be based on. So I don't know if uh, the panelists uh, would want to add to it. All right, and uh, all right, yeah, sorry, I was a bit slow with the mute button. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a bit embarrassing. Um, yeah, just, just a couple of things on on the standards. Yeah, standards are important. Um, on on the uh, technical side, um, we need to just you basically copy the web. The web is pretty interoperable. So, and, and one of the common standards for the web is you have a way of naming things, naming the trillion of resources in the web, and you have an addressing system. So we need a naming system and an addressing system. So you can just, so then everything becomes a URL and then you can pull that. And then you, you need a standards for the, the data that you pull as, as, as was being said earlier. So, so we need a certification uh, um, syntax uh, of some sorts and, and there are two starting points for that somebody put up a link to um, the IMS Global's work which is very good there is of course open badges which people have been using for some time and some companies use um, W3C has a standard called verifiable credentials which has the, the three elements I mentioned before issuers uh, um, receivers and verifiers so so the, the, the notion about behind W3C is that you could go into a bar um, and prove that you're over the age of 21 without giving away any personal information, and 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 and, uh, and again and, and having privacy. I, I fully would endorse what Angie said about skills. Skills is the glue. Skills is the glue between everything, and we, I don't think it's feasible. But if we had the skills standard, so everything else would be, uh, let's say, a, a standard for describing skills in all settings. Everything will be trivial, but we'll never get there. But it, instead, we'll, um, as Angie said, it would be good to have a standard for the learning outcomes of courses, which really map to skills, and also for job adverts. If we had a way of defining job adverts, at least syntactically, or the skills in job adverts, then you could easily map them um, to that, that. That would be uh, um, uh, really good. There's the whole notion of CVs. I've worked with companies about thinking of uh, um, a standard syntax for CVs. So again, with this technology, you could imagine having a CV writing tool, which automatically creates your CV from your data for a particular job. Uh, and again, we, we know at the EOU from some of our students, they, they don't even know what a CV is. So, so there's a whole host of, of, of scaffolding required there. Thanks, John. And uh, let's move on with some of the more questions here, because uh, we're trying to answer as many questions as we can. And there's a question from uh, D. Wu, and what are the relation 
relationship between blockchain and the micro credentials and additional badges? Is there any organization that's been working on this area as the leader? I think that uh, uh, John mentioned earlier about IMS Global to have the open badge and actually it's open badge to an old standard and uh, there may be newer one. But however, uh, the relationship between micro credentials and digital badges, these are just the kind of uh, uh, certificates in some uh, format. And but however, to issue them on the blockchain would make them verifiable, right? Just like a, a, a digital badge or any other certificates issued on a PDF document that is also digital, but however, it is uh, uh, very difficult to verify. And as a matter of fact, that uh, 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 with some of the, the, the PDF editor, and then uh, it actually is, uh, uh, it, it can be, you know, altered if some people uh, would want to, uh, to do it. And with the blockchain, because again, it's a distributed ledger technology that uh, it's extremely, uh, difficult for you to even to uh, make any uh, changes. That's why blockchain is called immutable. So um, uh, that answers that question. We also have a question from uh, Luke and uh, Alamo Community College District. And how many people do each of you have working on blockchain? How have your organization uh, uh, how, how have your organization do the work? I, I, I assume that's the question. So uh, uh, maybe uh, Piper and John, you guys can address the, the question about how many people do each of your organization work on the blockchain? Sure, um, you know, I'll give you a kind of a broad answer here. In the beginning, as we worked to figure this out, a tremendous number of people. Um, it took a lot of our IT, uh, professionals to help figure this out, working with our partner, um, our external partner. Uh, over time, however, that once we've gotten that figured out, uh, and this may answer another question I see in the chat, that you know the, the blockchain information, the transcript does have to be updated on a regular basis, and there has to be a feed created through IT to do that. So we started out, and I can't even give you numbers, but I would just guess that it was 10 to 15 IT people working a lot of time, a lot of hours in the beginning. Over time, that's dramatically increased. And, and I would guess at this point, we have anywhere from, you know, two to five people regularly engaged with the blockchain transcript. So, so of course, our role is a research and innovation lab. So, um, for us, there was a research focus, so I'm not sure if the numbers are useful, but we probably had um, a dozen, uh, 12 people um, working on different projects, but not just in the education space. So we did um, a COVID-19 certi COVID certification. Uh, we've done work with the inter in Internet of Things and also work in, uh, in the law domain. Um, it, it, if somebody's asking how, how many people does it take to maintain a blockchain, two or three people. If you need new interfaces, then um, the, they would be busy at work. But one of the things about the blockchain, if you think about an ecosystem, ideally the load is spread. So not all of the blockchain is maintained by one organization. You have multiple organizations. And there's a whole plethora of things I could say, but I won't, about how you maintain a blockchain. Because it, it, you even maintain the blockchain in a decentralized fashion. Well, thanks, and uh, time flies, right? And this, we still got a couple more questions, so then I'd like to try to get the, as many as we can. I think, uh, Piper, you just answered in some ways that question uh, from Sarah that asking about the, that the credentials, uh, making sure they're not expired, and then a, a potential logistic uh, nightmare, those, that is uh, absolutely true. That, uh, But however, I just want to offer that uh, uh, you know, uh, a student uh, record or data uh, is being updated as they, uh, you, you know, continue with their educational journey. And then uh, at the, uh, a kind of a point of time when somebody requested a transcript and um, uh, that transcript later may not be 
uh, updated as uh, the students may have uh, completed uh, more uh, classes or have, uh, uh, you, you know, participated into some, uh, uh, you know, activities. However, uh, just so you know that with the blockchain and then the idea because of the data at some point, then that the, well, as long as the student record system is uh, keeping updated with that student data, and then, and of course, the student when uh, he or she started uh, applying for another jobs so, or uh, more advanced degrees, and they can always come back and request another uh, updated transcript or 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 or, or degree for sure. And uh, so, uh, I just want to make sure that. Uh, uh, question got answered. So um, and now we're right on time. And uh, so I want to thank uh, all of our panelists for uh, your deep knowledge and very insightful and uh, in, to me inspirational answers and in how you have used uh, the, the, or planning to use blockchain technology not only to help empower our learners and but also trying to leverage this technology to solve some of the equity issues and so uh, please uh, for the audience if you can join me and give them a round of applause yay thank you russ turning back to you excellent great and thank you for a great session and great great answers and uh looks like we could have gone on for another good half hour with questions that are rolling going in now. Um, thank you for great work. And then uh, Megan, I'll turn it to you. To hey, I, I, just, I just want to ask John, how do you get a Queen's badge, man? I want a badge <laughs> that's from the Queen. That's what I want. <laughs> uh, it's in the post, thank you. <laughs> great. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you at the lightning talk coming up shortly. Bye.